I want to uh, welcome Professor and Dr. Nyoshevi from the. I have to look here. I have the the, the now the the pronouncement announced for me, but I I'm not sure I can say it right. But it's Raka. Institute of Physics, I hope you are satisfied. <laughs> and uh, it, it, he's from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And we are very happy and proud to have Nir Shaviv here to have a talk about, I'm going to read the title, which is Nothing New Under the Sun and the Sun's Lasting uh, Role in cha Climate Change. So, um, and I would recommend you after this talk to ask uh, questions uh, directly to um, Shaviv. And actually, I also want to tell uh, the audience that Shaviv and his family has just uh, presently arrived uh, back from um, Princeton, uh, the Institute of uh, Advanced Study, and. Uh, yeah, our, the famous uh, Einstein were there, working there, so we are very proud to have you here. Welcome. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure being here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, uh, it's actually interesting because uh, you mentioned Einstein, and uh, you couldn't pronounce my uh, department name, but uh, Einstein, when he died, he actually left all his... Uh, a, intellectual property to the Hebrew University, so uh, not to the uh, Institute for Advanced Study. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, climate, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the effects of the sun, and I'm going to talk about three particular things. Um, I didn't do that. Okay, uh, three particular things. Uh, I want to first review and show you that the sun has a large effect on climate. Then uh, we, want to, we will want to quantify it. I will also want to uh, uh, show you that uh, once uh, we understand that it's uh, relatively large, I want to discuss its uh, implications to the understanding of 20th and 21st century climate change. And uh, then I will want to end the third part is going to be a short discussion, discuss, discussion on the evidence uh, showing you that uh, the link between uh, climate and uh, solar activity is actually through something called uh, cosmic rays. Um, okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to show you that the sun has a large effect on climate. We're going to quantify it. I'm going to uh, show you that it is important to understand 20th century climate change. It has a uh, probably contributed something like uh, half uh, of the temperature increase over the 20th century, but it also allows us to uh, see the 20th century and 21st century, or climate change in general, with a fuller picture uh, in which things fall into place much more, uh, 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 much nicer. Uh, but uh, in particular, it falls into place uh, with a climate sensitivity which is on the low side, namely uh, changes in the energy budget that uh, are associated either with solar activity or with uh, human activity are on the low side. Uh, for example, if you double the amount of CO2, it will increase by only a small value. And uh, as, I was, as I said, I'm going to end with uh, discussing the cosmic rays. Okay, so now if you uh, suddenly have a seizure or something and you don't remember anything else, these are the takeaway points, and uh, that's it. Okay, so let's begin. First of all, the sun has a large effect uh, on climate. Uh, to begin with, uh, the sun is variable. Uh, this here is, for example, the sun in uh, UV. This is when the sun is in solar minimum. This is when it's in solar maximum. If we look at the sun, we can see things like sunspots. Those, the number of sunspots uh, varies uh, with the... Uh, a quasi-periodic 11-year uh, cycle. Uh, here you can see in X-rays uh, places where um, uh, the sunspots, uh, uh, where the sunspots are, they're, they're more luminous, uh, and things like that. So the sun has a lot of non-thermal uh, uh, behavior, and this behavior changes by quite a lot over a, a cycle of 11 years. Uh, basically, what happens is that every 11 years, the north and south magnetic uh, pole of the sun switch uh, polarity. So the full cycle is actually 22 years. And the interesting thing is that there are a lot of things which vary together with it. Uh, the sunspots, the strength of the solar wind, the, the magnetic field of the sun, 
uh, the amount of the UV that the sun uh, emits, and so forth. Um, and another important thing is that in addition to this 11-year solar cycle, we have variations in solar activity on longer time scales. Sometimes the 11-year solar cycle is stronger, and sometimes it's weaker. And sometimes, like uh, during the um, a latter half of the 17th century, it was particularly inactive. And that was also a period of a little ice age uh, here in Europe, right? I think uh, the Swedes could cross, right? And uh, it wasn't a good time for Denmark because of it. I think so. Um, so there are long-term variations, but there are also uh, very short-term variations. Uh, like sometimes uh, you get uh, feed lines closed and you get a gust in the solar wind. So we'll see that uh, on all those timescales, there are uh, variations in the sun and uh, concurrently on Earth in the climate. Okay, um, this is probably one of the nicest examples I know, showing you on one hand a proxy for solar activity. At the top you see the amount of carbon-14 derived from tree rings, uh, and this is a proxy of solar activity because carbon-14 is formed in the top of the atmosphere by spallation. You have high energy particles come from outside the solar system, they are called cosmic rays, and they hit the top part of the atmosphere, they form um, secondary products like carbon-14, which is, in this case, radioactive. Um, but the flux of those cosmic rays is modulated by solar activity. When the sun is more active and it has a stronger solar wind, less of these cosmic rays can reach the Earth. So we form less spallation products, and in particular, less carbon-14. So by looking at the amount of carbon-14 as a function of a year, uh, in the tree rings, you can know what solar activity was. So this is a proxy of solar activity. On the other hand, here at the bottom, we have a proxy for climate on Earth. In this case, we're looking at the oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 isotope ratios in stalagmites in a cave in Oman, in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. And this is a proxy for climate because water with oxygen-18 is heavier than water with oxygen-16, which means that the evaporation rate from the oceans is different, but it's going to be temperature dependent. So this thing basically is a proxy for what the temperature of the Indian Ocean is, because that's where the monsoon water going to those caves uh, came from. Okay, so you see a proxy for solar activity and a proxy for a climate, and I think there is a nice correlation. Okay, so most likely the sun affects the climate. I don't think it's vice versa, that the climate affects the sun. You think so? I don't think so. Okay, here is another example from the northern Atlantic. You see, uh, again, the carbon-14 in uh, blue, and in black you see evidence for whether it was cold or uh, warm in the northern Atlantic, because in colder periods you have a ice rafted debris uh, carried to southern uh, latitudes and leaving, and as this ice melts, it leaves this debris uh, on the ocean floor. So by digging cores from the ocean floors, you can know whether it was colder or warmer. So you see that there's a very nice correlation. And you can see this kind of correlations between solar activity and climate everywhere on Earth, in many places, um, implying that in a lot of places on Earth, there's a very strong influence of solar activity on the climate. Uh, going on shorter timescales, um, in fact, the first person to think that there is a correlation between solar activity and climate was uh, Sir William Herschel, and he didn't have a very good uh, temperature proxy, so what he did, he uh, looked at the price of wheat in the London uh, Wheat Exchange and tried to see whether there's a correlation between that and a sunspot number, and according to him, there was. Going forward 200 years, uh, this is probably the first paper that uh, in modern times that someone considered that uh, the sun has an effect on, on climate. Um, and here you see the uh, severity of winters in Europe. Again, this is the uh, Little Ice Age. And at the bottom you see some proxies for solar activity, and you see that the uh, Little Ice Age was when it was a the sun was particularly inactive, or during the medieval times when Vikings could uh, uh, encircle Greenland and call it Greenland, uh, the sun was uh, active. Well, probably they called it Greenland for PR purposes, like uh, come and settle down Greenland. 
and then people came there and <laughs> they were a little bit surprised. Okay, on shorter timescales still, you can see here uh, in black, sorry, in red, you can see solar activity. You so you can see the 11-year solar cycle. And in black, you can see the rate of change of the sea level based on tide gauges. Okay, so you can clearly see that every time the sun is more active, the oceans tend to expand. And the reason is that they absorb more heat and they expand uh, thermally. Okay, so the previous examples uh, were qualitative in the sense that they can be used to show you that there's a qualitative, there's a very clear link between solar activity and climate. But in this case, because we know by how much the oceans uh, should expand when they absorb a given amount of heat, we can actually calculate and quantify the effect that the sun has on the climate. Okay? So this allows us to use uh, the oceans as what's called a calorimeter to measure uh, the amount of a flux, the amount of heat that we get from the sun uh, in sync with the solar cycle. It turns out that this amount of heat is much larger. It's about seven times larger than what you would expect from just changes in the solar irradiance, from the solar luminosity over the 11-year solar cycle. So there must be some kind of another amplifying uh, mechanism. Uh, this was based on tide gauge records, which ends uh, roughly at this time, but you can actually see with the uh, altimetry data the same thing. Um, here in blue we see the uh, linearly detrended uh, sea level change, and um, in purple you see a fit which includes El Nino Southern Oscillation and solar activity, and you see that almost all sea level change on this time scale, except for the linear trend, which is associated with the melting of ice caps, you see that all those variations, or a large fraction of them, are associated with the sun and the Nino. Okay, so uh, what else do we have? We also have that uh, with the 11-year solar cycle, we see changes, um, in this case it's a cosmic ray flux, but it's a proxy of uh, solar activity, and we see changes in the low altitude cloud cover. Why is it interesting? It's interesting for two reasons. First, uh, as we shall see in the third part, it actually allows us to, a, or it is related to the mechanism itself associated with a, a, a linking solar activity and climate. The other interesting reason is that we have satellite data with which we can quantify the change in the energy budget on Earth associated with this change in cloud cover. The interesting thing is that this change in energy budget is exactly, or oh, consistently the same, as what you see goes into the oceans every solar cycle. What does it mean? It means that the sun has a large effect on climate, the effects can be quantified and it's very large and we see where it comes from. It comes from the fact that the cloud cover changes with the 11 year solar cycle. Okay? Okay, so uh, you can quantify the change in the solar radiative forcing in watts per square meter over the solar cycle and you can use, uh, I showed you the tide gauge record and the satellite data and you can use the cloud variations and satellite uh, data and uh, you can uh, use other uh, measurements and you can consistently show that the sun has a large effect on climate. This is the change that you would expect from just changes in the solar irradiance. Observations, what people usually take in climate models. So, one thing we know is that uh, a, the real effect of the sun is large, um, and it means that climate models should include it. Uh, the other thing is that we should think very carefully what is the mechanism responsible for this large uh, effect. Okay. Um, Second part, we know that the sun has a large, a large effect on climate. We now want to understand what does it imply for understanding 20th century climate change. Uh, in standard models, those that you would find in, say, the IPCC reports, 
we try to explain 20th century climate change. We know that the temperature increased by about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees over the 20th century. Uh, with mostly anthropogenic forcing, the fact that we pumped CO2 into the atmosphere, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, it changes the energy budget, and therefore it should cause some heating. Now, in order to explain this 20th century warming with the energy budget that is mostly anthropogenic, we need a climate with a relatively high sensitivity. Namely, that if we double the amount of CO2, the temperature will increase by a lot. If we change the energy budget because of the sun by one watt, the change in temperature is going to be large, and so forth. But this high climate sensitivity will then imply that a given change, uh, some scenario, emission scenario over the 21st century, will necessarily give you a large temperature increase over the 20th century, 21st century as well. But if the sun has a large effect as well, and we know that solar activity increased over the 20th century, if we now include the anthropogenic forcing with the solar forcing, which is actually comparable, we find that in order to explain the 20th century, we now need a low climate sensitivity. And this low climate sensitivity will imply that the same emission scenario over the 21st century will now give you a temperature increase which is on the low side. How much? Well, we can model it. This is an example for a model which includes a lot of things. Uh, we can try and fit the 20th century. And in fact, when you do that, you find that if you include the large effect of the sun, you can explain the 20th century with typical residuals, which are half as much as what a IPCC scenarios give you, a, or IPCC, or models employed by the IPCC. Um, because these models don't include the sun. Okay, if you include the sun, you can explain 20th century temperature change much better. Um, you can then use the models and integrate forward in time and uh, for different reasonable realizations, ask the question by how much the temperature is going to increase in those models where you include the sun into account, and then you can compare that to the IPCC models. Okay, so my best estimate is the temperature increase is going to be about one degree uh, over the 21st century uh, under a vanilla flavored uh, scenario. Okay, a, a little bit about climate sensitivity. Uh, this is, if you open the IPCC reports, for the first report, the second report, the third report, and so forth, this is the range that they claim that Earth's climate sensitivity should be. And in fact, it all dates back to some federal committee that uh, sat in 1979 in the US, the Charney uh, Committee, and since then they claim that it's between one and a half and four and a half degrees. What I claim is that if you include the sun into account, you find very consistent uh, uh, sensitivities, uh, which are typically like that. I can give you a few examples uh, showing you that the sensitivity should be on the low side. Uh, here you see the temperature increase over the past uh, 30 years. Um, and given that the IPCC scenarios are basically the same since the first IPCC report in 1990, it means that if those models were correct in 1990, and they should be still correct, and the temperature today should be within the predictions made in 1990. Are they? Well, we see here that they are not. The temperature, this is the range of predictions made in 1990 with models saying that the sensitivity should be one and a half to four and a half degrees. And this is what the temperature has done uh, in real life. What does it tell us? It tells us that those scenarios with a high climate sensitivity are inconsistent with the actual data. So what, do you, what should you do? You should modify the models. This is not exactly what the IPCC does. What the IPCC does is it resets its prediction clock every six years. So you're always within the range of predictions. On a completely different time scale, here you see half a billion years of uh, geological data. And here you see the, temp the CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is a logarithmic scale. So for example, 450 million years ago, 
you see that there was about 10 times as much CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. If CO2 has a large effect on climate, like a five degree increase per CO2 doubling, then sh surely this should have re reflected itself in the temperature reconstruction. But here at the bottom, you see the temperature reconstruction. And do you see any correlation between the two? No. The fact that there is no correlation between the two can be used to place an upper limit on climate sensitivity, one which is about one and a half degree per CO2 doubling. OK. Um, and then, of course, the 20th century, if you want to fit the 20th century with the sun, you find that the sensitivity should be on the low side. OK, so now a few minutes for the third part. What is the actual link responsible for linking solar activity to climate? The answer is cosmic rays. So what is the relation? Uh, I told you about cosmic rays. These are high energy particles which come from supernova remnants. Um, supernovae are massive stars. Uh, if you have a star which is, uh, say, 10 times more massive than the sun, when it dies, it dies in a big explosion, um, and uh, it ejects the, uh, um, its envelope at high velocities, uh, as much as a tenth the speed of light. Um, and the shock waves between those, uh, this envelope and the interstellar medium accelerate particles to high energies, and then they diffuse around in the Milky Way, and they can reach us. And those cosmic rays are the dominant source of ionization in the atmosphere. Okay, here you might have, this is not concrete, here you might have a radon coming from the concrete. This should be concrete. Um, so you might have uh, ionization uh, dominated by, uh, by radon. But everywhere else in the troposphere, in the lower part of the atmosphere, the ionization is governed by those high energy particles from supernovae that exploded typically 10 million years ago. Now, as I also told you, those cosmic rays are modulated by the solar wind. When the wind when the sun is more active and the wind is stronger, less of those cosmic rays can reach the Earth, and with it, the ionization in the atmosphere decreases. By how much? Over the solar cycle, this, uh, the rate of ionization changes by something like 10, 15% in the bottom few kilometers. Now, today we know that these ions play an important role in both the formation of small aerosols and their growth into larger aerosols, large enough such that when you reach 100% humidity, water has surfaces upon which they can condense and form clouds. Okay, so today we have evidence showing you that uh, uh, all those things, they uh, work. Um, and if we change the properties of the cloud, uh, we will change, like if we make the clouds whiter, we will reflect more of the sunlight, and that will change the energy budget. Okay, so a little bit about the evidence. Um, this is a group here with ETU. Um, uh, what we see here are several day-long reductions in the cosmic ray flux associated with what's called Fobosch decreases. That's gusts in the solar wind, which causes a reduction in the cosmic ray flux. And here you see um, various different parameters. Uh, this is the number of aerosols in the atmosphere. Sorry, this is the size of the aerosols. This is a different cloud data set showing you that the clouds react to those reductions in the cosmic reflux due to the solar gusts. Um, on much longer timescales, uh, which is actually the way I entered the, the field, you see something uh, else. Um, as I told you, cosmic rays come from supernova remnants, uh, but they are not distributed homogeneously around the Milky Way. In fact, uh, because a uh, they come from stars which live a relatively short lifetime of only several uh, tens of millions of years. Uh, it means that different places in the Milky Way have different densities of cosmic ray flux. And as we roam, as we rotate around the Milky Way, sometimes we see larger fluxes of cosmic rays, and sometimes we see lower fluxes. If cosmic rays affect the climate, we should see a correlation between this cosmic ray flux and climate on Earth. Now, because a variations of our solar activity give rise to a 10-15% change in the ionization uh, where the clouds form, but a 
the change in the cosmic reflux density over geological timescales is expected to be a factor of a few. Instead of a one degree effect, which is what we have associated with solar activity, in this case we should expect variations of say five or 10 degrees. These are huge variations and should be enough to push Earth completely out of ice ages or into deep freezes. So, is there a link? Okay, so as we rotate around the galaxy, we pass through spiral arms of the galaxy every so often. That's where most of the star formation takes place, uh, and therefore most of the cosmic ray acceleration. And we should witness higher fluxes of cosmic rays at those points. At the top, you see a reconstruction of the cosmic ray flux using iron meteorites. Uh, meteorites are exposed to uh, a cosmic rays, and they accumulate spallation products. Uh, so from them, you can actually reconstruct the cosmic ray flux. At the bottom, you see, again, the cosmic ray flux in red, and in black, you see the temperature reconstruction based on oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 isotopes in uh, brachiopods, in this case those things. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, this here, you can, over the past half billion years, you can reconstruct a quantitative, uh, quantitatively the temperature, but over the past billion years, you can see that every about 150 million years, there were ice age uh, epochs on Earth, and you can uh, uh, continue this reconstruction for the past billion years, and see that there were seven increases in the cosmic ray flux over the past billion years, and they all correspond to ice age epochs on Earth. A, on a slightly shorter time scale, uh, okay, so here you can have the temperature uh, reconstruction, and here you see the 150 million year uh, period associated with passages of the spiral arms. On a shorter time scale, you see these oscillations. Okay, you can massage the data, uh, remove the, high, uh, the, long, the 150 million year oscillation and the linear trend, and uh, then bin it, and you get something which looks like this. This is uh, the temperature after you move the 150 million years. Uh, on shorter time scales, you should expect something in addition. Uh, not only do we pass through spiral arms every so often, but uh, we also, across the galactic plane every about uh, 32 million years. Okay, so what else do we expect? In addition to the variations due to spiral arm passages, we expect that every time we pass through the galactic plane, when it is colder, uh, when there is more cosmic rays, it should be colder on Earth. So we should see a 32 million year oscillation in the temperature data. And this is what you get from theory. You can actually fold the data over 32 million years, like an old uh, analog TV. So this is time folded over 32 million years, and this is time. So you see that there's a phase where it was cold and phase when it was warm on Earth. And uh, you see, so you see the 32 million year oscillation. But the interesting thing is that you see a secondary oscillation uh, in the data. This secondary oscillation is consistent in phase and period with the fact that we are not rotating in a circle around the galaxy, but sometimes we are closer to the center of the Milky Way. The density is higher and we're oscillating faster, and sometimes we're further out. So you can see all the galactic motion in the geological data. Okay, um, so we have lab measurements taking place in the sky lab uh, here at uh, DTE. Well, that was actually before you moved to DTE, right? Um, so you can see that when you increase the ionization, you increase the uh, nucleation. Uh, this experiment was repeated uh, at CERN, and surprise, surprise, they found the same thing. Uh, you can uh, show that you increase the growth rates uh, uh, from, CCN, from CNs to CCNs. Uh, you can Google something called uh, ship tracks and show you that wherever ships uh, pollute the atmosphere by burning dirty fuel, those exhaust particles uh, serve as cloud condensation nuclei. So you can see that if you increase the number density of cloud condensation nuclei, you change the properties of clouds. Okay, so everything in this uh, is known. 
And uh, with this, I'll end. We see that the sun has a large effect on climate. We can quantify it and show that something uh, should be amplifying the solar activity. It cannot be just changes in the solar irradiance. Um, the effect is most likely through a cosmic ray flux uh, modulation, and um, it's important, but people ignore it. Why? I don't know. Okay, so this is all. Thank you very much, Nia Shiviv. It was very exciting. And I would say that because time is a very important factor in your work while you're in Denmark, I'll uh, uh, recommend you to just, uh, let's say, have questions in a period of five, maximum five minutes. Is that okay? I don't care. Okay, uh, fine. Hello, hi. Uh, can you quantify the effect of the single supernovas uh, in this work? Because we have a few examples of nearby supernova and they, in principle, should leave a trace also if uh, the cosmic ray is uh, this effect. It's an excellent question, uh, but the answer is it's very hard. The reason is that uh, even, I mean, if you look at very recent supernovae like um, a there was a Tychos uh, supernova discovered here in, uh, in Denmark. Um, a, it took place a, a relatively far away. What do I mean by relatively far away? A, it takes the cosmic rays a relatively long time to diffuse from that distance to our location. So long that over this time scale, there are actually many supernovae. So we cannot see the effect of a single supernova unless, unless it is really, really close by. Um, in such a case, um, okay, so in principle, it is possible that over the past uh, several tens of millions of years, there was maybe one or two supernovae which were close enough such that the cloud of cosmic rays could have given you an increase in the cosmic ray flux for something like 10,000, 100,000 years. Uh, which would give you a cosmic ray winter. Uh, so we know that those things should have happened, uh, but the question is now whether it is possible to detect them, and it's very hard. One way would be to uh, dig uh, for a ocean cores and look, for example, a, for things like a, a iron 60 or something else which is formed by the supernova. Uh, there are some indications that this might have happened, but it's very hard to pinpoint and say that, you know, 27 million years ago, there was a particular supernova and we could see its effect. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Yes. Uh, it's, it's more political, actually. You say that IPCC, instead of including solar, solar effects into the uh, weather models, they reset their their calculations. Um, can you give a more ex specific example? I would, I would, I would um, assume what they do is they, they uh, update their models. That would be their, be their ex explanation. So uh, can you say a little bit more about uh, this resetting of the Okay, the um, so it's clear that the climate models that uh, we have today, um, especially those employed by, uh, for example, the IPCC, are much more elaborate and they include much more physics than, say, models which uh, we had uh, in the early 1990s. Um, they're much better, and they, you, with them you can do much more than you could do back then. But it turns out that the crucial thing with which you want to, uh, or, uh, to predict what will happen, say, in the future is climate sensitivity, and those models are not any better in determining climate sensitivity than they were, th uh, how much is it, 25 years ago. Uh, you could also see it by their claim. They claim that the range of climate sensitivities is one and a half to four and a half degrees per CO2 doubling, which is exactly the same as it was in 1990. So how come, even if the climate models are better, how come this thing is not any better? And the reason that the climate models cannot predict climate sensitivity any better is because 
the largest uncertainty in climate sensitivity is uh, the way that uh, cloud cover behaves. What do I mean? Uh, suppose we double the amount of CO2. We know that this corresponds to a change in the energy budget of about 3.8 watts per square meter. Now, if Earth didn't have any feedbacks whatsoever, if you just differentiated what's called the Stefan Boltzmann's uh, law, you would get that, you, uh, that this 3.8 watts would have given you a temperature increase of slightly less than 1.2 degrees. But if you increase the surface temperature by, say, 1.2 degrees, you evaporate more water from the oceans uh, because the oceans are warmer. Um, and we know that water vapor is an excellent greenhouse gas, so you would want to amplify this, uh, this temperature increase even more. However, if you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, you will also have more clouds. And the clouds can have a range of effects. And it turns out that the climate, or the largest uncertainty, uh, or the largest, uh, the most important parameter determining the climate sensitivity is the way that the cloud cover is treated in the climate models, because the cli we don't understand the microphysics well enough so that from first principles we can say that if the temperature changes by a given amount or the uh, water or the humidity changes by a given amount, by how much the cloud cover will change. So the climate models basically have recipes to describe the change in the cloud cover, and this recipe which is used in the climate models basically gives you the climate sensitivity of the model. So even though the models today are much more elaborate than they were 25 years ago, the largest uncertainty, which is cloud cover, is still there, and therefore they cannot be used to predict climate sensitivity. Now, as for my remark on uh, resetting the climate, uh, the climate predictions, like every six years they come up with a new uh, scientific report, and they say, this is what the temperature have been, has been doing in the past, and now we predict what the temperature is going to do in the future. They don't go back to the predictions that they have done in the first IPCC report and say, look, these were the predictions back in 1990, and the temperature today hasn't uh, increased uh, or wasn't in this range of predictions, therefore there's something wrong in our climate models. They don't do that. Yes, thank you. Is there any further questions? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the aerosols you mentioned, uh, what are they chemically? May their origin or their precursors maybe because of human origin? Uh, okay, so you have a range of uh, aerosols. Um, you have the, oh, oh, what can serve as cloud condensation nuclei. You, you can have a, a near the ocean, you can have a sea salt uh, serve as, a, as, a, as basis. You can have dust from a, from a, from a desert. Uh, but it turns out that probably the most important aerosols are those that are grown from a sulfuric acid in water molecules and sometimes a, a additional molecules like ammonia or whatever, which can, which can facilitate the, uh, the nucleation and growth. Uh, but it's basically, I mean, the most important ingredient in this case is uh, sulfuric acid, um, which comes from oxidation of SO2, which comes from uh, either volcanoes or oxidation of uh, DMS. Like if you go to the ocean, which is not far from here, and you have this typical uh, algae smell, that's DMS. So, and that. Um, What's the answer of uh, IPCC to your research? I mean, why don't they use your results to improve their model? Okay, so there are two questions here. Uh, what is the, perhaps? The first one is, the first one is um, what is their answer? Like you. Uh, there's no answer, it's, uh, it's being ignored. Is it ignoring your, your research at all? Like it has, it, look, this paper, this, this result, this uh, quantification that you have, uh, here, where is the graph? This result shows you that the sun has a large effect on climate. Okay, it was published in 2008. The IPCC should have included it in their last uh, scientific report, but they didn't, they ignored it. And it, it was published in the Journal of Geophysical Research. It's like the mainstream journal in uh, geophysics. It wasn't in some obscure conference proceedings that took place in Bora Bora. Okay, uh, so it's ignored. Why? 
I don't know. I mean, I can speculate, but... Uh... Yeah. I think the, the time is running. It's okay. I it's, mean, it's again, it's again political. Um, and not including uh, significant results could either be at discarding it rather scientifically or political. So uh, what would your suggestion be if we, the audience, wanted to put this into a, um, um, a political context so that it couldn't be ignored, at least commented, in the next IPCC report? Um, yeah, uh, Ulla, I think the time is up. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's end this session and um, thank you for... I, no, I was okay. joking because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't record it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the answer is, uh, I don't know, it's like, uh, you know, blogsphere is uh, filled with, uh, you know, activity and people do actually understand that, you know, the sun has a large effect on climate, but it still hasn't uh, percolated to, you know, the right... Uh, uh, no, communities, I don't know. Um, I, I don't have an answer to this question. Uh, but, you know, they, they should have said, okay, we, we don't, uh, you know, uh, Professor Svensmark has his, uh, uh, his work, and uh, they could think that it's controversial, and you could think that anything I said here about cosmic rays is is BS. Still, even if you don't know what the mechanism is, you see that the sun has a large effect on climate, but it's ignored. So even though it's controversial, and it shouldn't be because, I mean, you saw the evidence, how clear it is, but even if you don't believe it, a word I'm saying, still there's evidence that the sun is doing or has a large effect on climate, but it's ignored. Why? I don't know. Well, I know, but uh, I won't say. Um, would your predictions then be able to, or your model, would that be able to predict sea level rise and temperature rise solely, or is it a contribution to the already existing Okay, models? so it is a contribution, um, and a, it is... I mean, I don't know what the sun is going to, be in the f to, to do in the future. Some people say that uh, we think we're entering uh, the another uh, mound minimum and therefore there's going to be another little ice age and so forth. I don't think you can uh, predict it. Uh, I remember a, a few years ago, I saw in a conference, in a, sorry, not in a conference, uh, someone began his talk by showing all the predictions that people have made uh, for what solar activity is going to be in the next uh, solar cycle, from a solar minimum to, like, from a very low maximum to a very high maximum. It's like someone saying, these are all the predictions for what the lottery uh, numbers are going to be, and someone is going to win. So I don't think you can predict it. And in this sense, I don't think we can know what the sun is going to do on the, in the 21st century. So I cannot predict this thing. I cannot, I can... Uh, give a range of predictions for what uh, the sun could be doing um, and with my I think better estimate for climate sensitivity I can try to give you a range for what the temperature changes are, uh, are going to be and with it uh, a range for what the sea level rise is going to be so I think sea level rise over the 21st century is going to be of order um, a 10 to 15 centimeters um, is it good for Denmark I don't know uh, it depends. <laughs> One, um, perhaps a little more technical question. How come the solar wind in itself doesn't create these uh, clouds? The solar wind, uh, even though it is uh, charged particles, uh, uh, is not, or the energy of the particles in the solar wind is much lower than the energy of the cosmic rays. Uh, the cosmic rays come with energies of typically a GV and more. A GV means that uh, it's a the protons that are uh, beginning to be relativistic, but it's only like 10 GV protons uh, which can penetrate, or the secondaries can penetrate the atmosphere. So that's an energy of 10 GV. The highest energy particles in the solar wind is about a few hundred MeV, so it's 
a, a one and a half orders of magnitude smaller than what you need in order to penetrate the atmosphere and do anything. So the sun doesn't do a lot in this sense. Oh, sorry, it does do a lot, but it doesn't do directly to the solar wind. I think we will say thank you to Nyashibiv. Um, if you want his contact information, you're most welcome to contact me. My name is Ulla Svensmark. Uh, I'm working at the, the DGU library. So um, let's give Nyashibiv a hand and say thank you for this exciting talk.